My name is Andrew Swift. I'm a Master's of Public Policy student here at Johnson Shoyama. And my project is looking at First Nation financial accountability um, within Canada. So for my study, um, I'm looking at different accountability um, processes within the Canadian government and different policies that have been implemented over the, the last 10 years. And the method that I used was primarily interviews uh, supplemented with document analysis. Uh, however, the largest bit of data that I collected was through interviews. I was able to get four participants uh, for my study. The original goal was six, um, but you sort of roll with the punches and, and go with what you have. Uh, the four, though, were, were great interviews, and I got a lot of data and uh, had to pull in data from, from other sources, uh, namely through documents. Choosing a method is a is a unique process and you will find that by reviewing previous literature in the area will give you a good indication of what type of method you will want to choose and so in reviewing literature on financial accountability with first nation communities i found that i was um, obviously going to be taking a qualitative approach and that semi-structured interviews were going to provide the data that i needed Setting up interviews can be a fun process. <laughs> so I, I was fortunate in that having had government experience before and knowing how, um, knowing how scheduling just works, the little things are very important. So because my participants were government, mainly government uh, employees, uh, senior directors and managers, they live by their BlackBerry. They live by their calendar and they, they have generally an admin assistant who does all the scheduling for them. So those are the people that I targeted first. Um, I was under a tight timeline, so I would call them directly, worked with them, got, um, got dates and times, but it was a challenge. So that was really, as soon as I knew who I wanted to interview, um, which I actually found those names through government directories. I then reached out to their admin assistants right away, um, which worked in my favor and worked well because you can get bogged down um, trying to just chase people to get interviews secured. And uh, it's, it's a challenging process to go through. Preparing for interviews is a very vital step. In fact, I would say beyond just interviews, you know, in your entire research process through developing your proposal, that is the backbone. That is your roadmap. And so you need to be very careful uh, and very attentive and mindful in that process because if you aren't, it makes the rest very difficult. Um, and I know a lot of my colleagues and I struggled with that through the year, you know, trying to find that guidance, what, you know, what to do. Um, in terms of interviews, um, I am a bit meticulous. It's a bit funny. I can be scattered one day and the next and I'm a bit anal retentive and I will absolutely admit that. <laughs> so this, uh, I think having the detail um, or attention to detail when you're preparing something like an interview is very important. So for example, I developed a whole initial contact package. I had my exemption form included from my ethic, from the ethics board here at the university. I made sure there was nothing hidden. Everything was open. I had an introductory letter, cover page explaining the methods or the research topic, um, you know, what the exemption meant, uh, the steps I was going to go through, um, that sort of stuff. Following that, I had a little line so they could consent, um, but a verbal consent was was fine anyway. It was just being showing them um, that I that I knew what I was doing. That was really the goal. That was instilling confidence in them. Um, that's the most important because then when they're comfortable, they will give you better data. So after that, I had all the questions. Nothing, nothing to be hidden. Um, that's especially important when there's something very sensitive at hand, or there could be sort of an air of reluctancy or caution on the topic and then all my contact information. And so I sent that well in advance of the interview and followed up. Um, that, and I, and I found out that most of them actually didn't read the questions, but, or they skimmed through it, but they felt comfortable. Uh, so that preparation, that didn't take long, but attention to detail in every question and making sure that package was you know, top notch uh, and sent in time was very helpful. Um, 
the follow-up from the interview is also very important. So saying thank you and immediately like a day after, no more than two days I would say, you know, following up and saying thank you for your time and giving them uh, an expectation. I will have this interview report or transcript or whatever you have promised, you know, by set time. Um, not only did that help me meet a deadline, uh, it also gave them comfort in knowing that I'm not running away with their knowledge and not giving it back to them uh, because they were very generous in sharing their time. As I've learned with this research project, uh, there are definitely some challenges. <laughs> uh, and there's challenges with anything and to expect otherwise I think would be a bit foolhardy. Uh, the challenges I encountered were in securing the interviews with First Nation communities and I expected that. Mm -hmm. I expected um, and anticipated that I would need to give them more time, about six months. Unfortunately, in the end, um, given a mixture of the nature of the research topic and its sensitivity, particularly right now within uh, Canadian politics, um, some were taken to court. So it's, it's obviously a very sensitive topic with them. And the timeline I was under over the summer made it difficult to secure interviews with them. So in the end, I wasn't able to interview communities and I had to source out uh, public statements on the accountability policies, which I was lucky because it was such a high profile topic and, and still remains so, there's lots out there. So that is, that is the biggest um, sort of cautionary advice that I could give to anyone is give yourself as much time as you can ahead of time just to, to secure those, those interviews. Uh, unexpected uh, interruptions in interviews were something that I <laughs> encountered. So two of my interviews were with uh, senior officials from Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada at the headquarters in Ottawa. And I had had this one uh, interview, for instance, scheduled and rescheduled about three times planning ahead. I had left two weeks just for that interview after I saw the first rescheduling occur. So I, I walked in and I was waiting at the lobby to be checked in by security and waiting and waiting and waiting. <laughs> and so this gentleman um, ended up not being able to let me interview him because he was he just was swamped and so last minute uh, tasked it to a a uh, colleague of his, um, a financial advisor, who knew nothing about the project because I had sent the questions early on and they did require some, some pre preparation. And so managing that was a challenge. Uh, you have to take, or I had to take some time to catch them up on what the research project was and really establishing a relationship because I had already established a relationship by email or by phone. And so this individual was naturally very apprehensive because the subject was very sensitive. Um, you know, they were in charge of a very controversial and remains a very controversial piece of legislation. And so little things like even asking for an audio recording, uh, they got their back up. And I learned very quickly um, that I had to really spend more time to sort of establish a very comfortable space. I had assumed that they knew or that they had read these, these questions. And so, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get an audio recording of the interview because they weren't comfortable, which just meant I was a little bit more disengaged from the questioning because I was trying to record everything at the same time. And that, that is a... That is a challenge and a skill that I'm not quite good at. <laughs> Making sure that you have the right data or enough data uh, is an ongoing process. It's the question is, when do I stop? When do I have enough? When do I not have enough? And what am I missing? Those are really uh, sort of important questions that you have to ask yourself while you're in the interview because you, you are not going to have that opportunity again. And that person's very busy. And so I, uh, knowing that I didn't have the First Nation perspectives was a bit disappointing. Uh, however, when we got to that point and that realization, I wasn't so worried because the four interviews I had done with um, the First Na or the uh, government officials, they were all corroborating each other. So, you know, it could have been four, it could have been six, it could have been 40. And I was comfortable that after four, I was only going to keep hearing the same information. So it was, in a sense, theoretical saturation. 
fancy term I learned the other day. I was all very happy. Uh, but it really was that in, in its, you know, in that sense. Um, because I, there were obviously some minor differences or variations on, on the same story, but it was just an incredible amount of detail, particularly from the regional perspectives, those on the ground and the operational side. But they all corroborate each other. So I thought, well, let's see how this works with some of the documents that I'm pulling on the First Nation side. And, and they were, they were all, they've all been validating each other. They've all been bouncing off each other. There really hasn't been anything ground shaking um, or, you know, earth shatteringly new. So that at that point, um, this is just recently, I felt comfortable. I thought, okay, well, this validates my, my methods. I'm, I'm getting the correct information and they're all validating each other. Something I learned, <laughs> this is a personal bit, it's important. I, I struggle with uh, interrupting people and I struggle with communication in my personal and, and you know, professional and academic relationships. I am ex an excitable personality. Listening to those interviews and transcribing those interviews um, in some instances, I almost wanted to cry <laughs> because it was, it was a hard wake up call, um, to have your insecurities of thinking you talk too much or whatever, right in front of you and display. And I think that's important. So if you can take the time beforehand and maybe record a conversation with a friend and see how you interact, because I realized after I cut off uh, a couple people in the first, the first interview, I cut off that individual quite a few times and that what that says to that person and was glaringly obvious to me was what you have to say is not so important it's what i have to say is more important i didn't realize the power of that or what that how that came across until i listened to that i've heard it i knew it but i didn't understand it and really take the time to sit down and role play sit with some friends and interview them with your questions ahead of time i think and record it and then stop and listen to it and say, okay, what can I learn from this before I do the real thing? That's, a, that's something I really learned.